Welcome to everyone. Um, what we're going to discuss in this uh, two-day meeting is MOSRP's impact delivery to date, this year's progress, and our plans. This is a set of links to different presentations that occurred in the last year or so that I thought might be uh, of interest, including recognition to, uh, that the uh, SEG has given to this group in terms of the delivery and impact. Uh, one particular presentation that I would uh, might call to your attention is the one on the very bottom here, is that there was a Petrobras workshop this past August where the um, board of um, directors of Petrobras called a meeting and invited people to speak about what's the next 25 years in uh, se seismic technology and what will be game-changing um, opportunities. And so I, I suggest that uh, uh, a look at that last might be of interest. I end that talk. I end that talk by saying, how would you know in this meeting if something is game changing? My suggestion is, after someone speaks at the meeting, if the participant at the meeting looks around the room and everyone's nodding, it's not game changing. You have to be ready for some level of discomfort for new ideas. Uh, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable to be able to uh, support, recognize game-changing capability. So uh, this group is about identifying and addressing seismic challenges. Seismic challenges occur because every method uh, that we call scientific and certainly seismic methods make assumptions without exception. They're always a work in progress. They're never the final word, the final answer. Uh, when the assumptions that a methods make are satisfied, the methods are effective. And when those assumptions and prerequisites conditions are not satisfied, then those methods have uh, problems and can uh, fail and can contribute to dry hole drilling. So what did, uh, among the types of assumptions, methods have uh, data requirements. Uh, you have to acquire a certain kind of uh, types of data, extent of data, sampling of data. You need to have uh, adequate compute power to run algorithms. And then there are assumptions within the algorithm uh, themselves uh, uh, beyond uh, what data is required and compute that uh, need to be satisfied for the method to be effective. Well, what are you going to do uh, when uh, the assumptions are violated? Corey Holting, Chevron, welcome. When uh, assumptions are violated, you have uh, uh, two choices from our point of view. One is find a method to satisfy the assumption. Yes. The other is, if you can't find a method to satisfy the assumption, find a new method that doesn't make that assumption, that avoids the assumption. In this group, we adopt one or the other of these attitudes for different problems. If we can see a, um, a method to better satisfy a requirement of a current method, we uh, seek to uh, develop and deliver that capability. If we don't see how uh, an improvement to a current methods uh, requirement could be provided, under that uh, circumstance, we seek a method that doesn't have that condition, that uh, requirement. So for example, you'll see methods here to improve uh, reference wave uh, removal, uh, ground roll, without affecting reflection data, deghosting. Those are methods, those are prerequisites that every seismic method that we know of uh, makes. And we have developed, this group has developed, more capable methods to satisfy those assumptions, not to avoid those assumptions. Walter, welcome. So uh, MOSRP takes ownership of the entire seismic processing chain. What that means is, that's not some PAP. What it means is, if a method that's developed here has prerequisites, conditions that need to be satisfied, we don't say that's not our business. Everything the method requires is our business. And to one way to understand it, uh, we take ownership of this whole tree. In other words, uh, starting with separating reflection data from reference wave, Reflection data means data that has reflected from the Earth, and then we de-ghost. And then once you have 
a deghosted source and receiver, then we, then we define multiples and primaries. And the first thing is removing free surface multiples, then removing internal multiples, then uh, imaging and inverting primaries. And imaging and inverting primaries with velocity, imaging and inverting primaries without velocity. So we're looking for a consistent linked uh, set of processes. We don't want to make an assumption earlier up in the chain that then is in violation with something required lower in the chain. So here's a, a brief overview of migration. Migration methods evolved from post-stack time to post-stack depth to pre-stack time, pre-stack depth, RTM. In every a step in, in that evolution, the migration method became more capable, more physically complete. And in every step in that evolution, there was an increased demand on subsurface information. There's a similar um, evolution in multiple removal. This is a, a list of multiple re removal methods that evolved with increasing capability and that uh, evolution had a commensurate, at every step, a need for increased velocity information or velocity and more. An issue is, as the industry trend moved to deep water and more complex onshore and offshore plays, the ability to provide that uh, detail and necessary subsurface information often failed, okay? So significant contributions, just to summarize, this past year, I would say there are four. New pre-processing pre methods, you'll see. In other words, there are, uh, basically this meeting is in four sections in terms of what uh, this group is uh, um, presenting. That We have two uh, um, invited speakers, Neil Scrub from MIT and Mark Meyer, who just joined our physics department, uh, who will speak, uh, both will speak later this afternoon. But uh, uh, separate from that, we have, uh, you can separate this group into four parts. And we separate it by the way data is processed. The first thing we do is advances in pre-processing. The major advances, Jing Wu is here somewhere. Uh, removal of ground roll, yes. Uh, without damaging reflection data, a major issue for onshore processing. Uh, and uh, uh, Jing Wu and her colleagues, uh, Zhen Zhang and Yu Chang Shen, developed methods for uh, accommodating non horizontal acquisition. In other words, if you're on the ocean bottom or onshore or even towed streamer, you, your acquisition is often not horizontal. And many processing methods assume that it is. The first thing they show is what is the damage to every processing step if it's not horizontal and you assume it is. And then uh, Zhen Zhang and Yu Chang uh, Shen show you how to accommodate the topography, yes? And the difference that makes in deghosting, free surface multiple removal, internal multiple, and depth imaging. So that step are often ignored, yes, as people look at RTM or whatever, FWI, they're ignoring the topography of the surface is uh, an accommodating, first understanding the damage that ignoring it will cause, and then recognizing the contributions of the people I just mentioned towards pr uh, start your whole processing uh, um, chain uh, with that understanding. People often do PVZ, deghosting, with uh, watch what happens when you do that. You'll see the difference, yes? versus accommodating that surface for deghosting, yes, and all subsequent. So th that is a first bullet, is uh, um, arranging for onshore ocean bottom uh, wave separation methods, and, and including allowing for and accommodating algorithms that allow for non-horizontal acquisition. Then uh, the second bullet is the uh, classic um, return on investment view of our group, multiple removal. The, the multiple removal um, methods delivered from this group are used by every major service company. And they recognize the where the origin is from this group. PGS, CGG, Schlumberger, all uh, uh, provide service 
that is inverse scattering series, free surface, and internal multiple. The internal multiple method is an attenuator. It predicts the exact time and approximate amplitude of a, uh, an internal multiple. What happens in practice is nobody wants to approximately remove the multiple. They want to remove the multiple. So what they do after that ISS attenuator is they come in with a criteria. The criteria is that if the multiple was not there in some interval of time and interval of space, then if that multiple is absent, in that interval you have less energy than if the multiple was there. Yes? That's called, and then they use that criteria to make the difference between what the ISS attenuator does and the actual multiple. Remove it, yes? That is a very useful method. I think the origin of that energy minimization ad adaptive concept is uh, Hoos Burkout and Eric for sure, yes? And it's had uh, much success. As long as the multiple, first of all, the ISS attenuator comes from here, yes? We're talking about the adaptive comes from their thinking. The, that has, uh, uh, is the most capable method today for uh, removing internal multiples, but only works if the internal multiple is isolated. If you have a, an internal multiple like this all by itself, then ISS attenuation, which gets the exact time and approximate amplitude, plus energy minimization adaptive just removes it, yes? If, however, you have an internal multiple that's interfering with a primary or proximal, then if you have, uh, for example, a destructive interfering primary and internal multiple, if that multiple comes out, you have more energy, not less. In fact, it could be almost invisible when they're interfering. So there's the, whole con the whole criteria of energy minimization fails, yes, let alone how you apply it. It's not an LP norm issue, okay? The whole criteria fails. So that second bullet is part of a three-pronged strategy to deal with the removal of an internal multiple that's interfering with the primary without damaging the primary. That's the key. And that issue occurs all over the Middle East, the North Sea. Um, Total published a paper. They said, you know, this issue of interfering primaries and multiples, you don't need complex media. North Sea is flat as a pancake. It's not a velocity problem. If they didn't have multiples, it's not an imaging issue. But they do have multiples, and those internal multiples are sitting on the primary. And at the time that Bertrand Ducou and Eyal uh, published that uh, paper showing that issue, this second bullet was not available. The second bullet is an internal multiple eliminator where you get the exact time and the exact amplitude. Plus you need pre-processing, plus you need a new adaptive that we'll talk about. You're gonna always need an adaptive. Why? I don't care what the physics is that we write here, the real world's more complicated. There are always things in the real world that's outside of whatever we write. I don't care what the equation is. And if you ignore that, that's at your peril, yes? So you need a dial, and we'll discuss uh, an example of a dial that would be consistent with the method, not just put in separately, derives from the method. So um, that's the second bullet, more effective internal multiple removal when m internal multiples interfere with primaries without damaging the primary. Okay, that's the key. Anyone can remove any internal multiple. Okay, the problem is what else do you remove? Um, the third bullet is, this is a new project this year. This is the first migration method that's equally effective at all frequencies at the target and reservoir. The first thing we'll show you is that all current migration methods are not equally effective at all frequencies at the target and reservoir. In other words, if we're calling something the first, you better say why everything else today isn't, yes? So we, we'll explain that, yes? And then we'll show a method that uh, is, and then in addition, uh, colleagues Dr. Chung Fu and Yang Li Zhou will show resolution differences, yes? Resolution differences, we're uh, very grateful to Corey Holting for good suggestions about how to uh, uh, deal with the wedge issue. You'll see not only a reflector in resolution, you'll see resolution differences where the, the new migration that we're talking about is able to discern that there is 
a layer, whereas RTM would think it's a reflector. That's a very serious issue, okay? You don't see a layer, you don't think there's a reservoir, yes? If you can resolve two, you can start thinking about permeability and porosity, yes? In the layer. Okay, so that's the third bullet. You'll see uh, a set of talks on that. And last but not least, you're gonna see uh, our um, revisiting ISS direct depth imaging without the velocity. And what was the issue that stopped us before? Uh, there was, uh, it, it progressed to a, what we would call a viability test on field data, which was successful. What was the issue? How come it's not in the toolbox, yes? And what are we doing about that? What are we doing between it showing viability and making ISS direct depth imaging without a velocity model, something you can use in a regular way? So we're taking a step towards that. And that's Dr. Chow Ma, yes. So that's, this shows you sort of uh, in the evolution of uh, methods, you have these columns, embryonic, concept, initial synthetic, complex synthetic, field data tests, and then documented code delivery. For pre-processing and deghosting, we have through documented code delivery, Dr. Jim Mayen in the back was responsible for the field data tests at ExxonMobil and PGS, and there's documented code for, um, for the, that capability at that, of, at that time. Free surface multiple elimination and internal multiple attenuation. A whole uh, uh, a group of people here, many people, including uh, Paolo Terengi and others, um, uh, went from uh, to uh, arrange for 2D and 3D documented code that people use. And then ISS depth imaging, these are the, the projects prior to this year, went through a field data test that showed viability but the state of that capability is not ready to be a toolbox, and we'll explain why, yes? Okay. And then this year, this is the, the project. You see one new project, which is the first migration equally effective at the target and reservoir and comparisons with RTM. That last item, that last column, requires a velocity model, okay? Requires a velocity model. It's just within current capability to within current concepts of migration to provide a more capable an image, an image which is equally effective at all frequencies. Okay, so one question is, what do you mean equally effective at all frequency? It doesn't mean it's effective at any frequency. It says it's equally effective. If you give me the wrong velocity or you ignore absorption, yes? You're gonna, we're saying whatever your velocity model is, we're not gonna add an issue, yes? that's gonna be um, damaging low compared to high, yes? Equally effective does not mean effective. Effective has a lot of requirements, yes? That is not what we're providing. If you have, the, you understand? Yes. But it's not prejudicing, yes? In other words, if you settle on some velocity, it's not gonna be adding an issue of making it more uh, effective at the high end than low. Okay, so this is where uh, we're looking. You can see that fourth column. We're gonna be soliciting field data uh, for the, uh, uh, the uh, multiple elimination and also for the, uh, the, um, the last item, the last uh, column, the last row. Okay, there's a new opportunity from MOSRP that we've described to our sponsors. The traditional membership, which will remain, uh, um, is uh, the sponsor pays a fee and we deliver several things. The most important uh, thing we deliver that's not on this bullet is we uh, work to train, educate students on how do you identify a problem and then how do you address a problem, okay? Identifying a problem is non-trivial, okay? What we learned from our experience is you don't go to researchers to find out what problems are, okay? You go to people in operating units because they'll tell you what works and what doesn't work. They have no interest in what label, yes? They'll just say, we don't know why, but this method of yours, Wegline, is not working here. 
they're gonna, they have no interest in um, getting some award for a method, yes? So that, I learned that the hard way, okay? Uh, the, the, the trick is we get our funding from researchers, yet we say this. You understand? It's, uh, it's been my experience. So uh, in addition, we uh, deliver uh, reports and proprietary codes. That's the traditional relationship. We're describing a second opportunity here, which is a collaborative, co uh, cooperative opportunity where a company might have a, a data set or a play that they would like to see a certain capability from here applied, yes? And they would arrange a project together with us where we would model it together with them uh, and run the codes on synthetic and then their field data. That's a separate uh, activity from sponsorship, yes? And it would, there would be funding required for that to support postdoc or people who would uh, engage in that activity. Could you be a non-sponsor and have that second option? Yes, you could. But you won't get the code, yes? You'll get the result, and you'll pay more than a sponsor would for that same type of service, okay? But that's available. Why are we doing this? We're in a, uh, we still remain in a relative uh, difficult situation in the oil business today. And to say to somebody, this uh, method is gonna be ready for five years and look at all this mess, that's a little abstract when they worry what are they gonna do in that quarter, you know? Uh, am I gonna have a job in that quarter? Yes, for example, yes? That's a, a very, uh, it sounds very um, detached from the real world, this kind of, so if you, however, uh, engage with them on a project that they're interested in having a successful outcome, Yes, that is more uh, digestible, yes? And it will provide funds and experience for us on field data, yes? So the, both of those options are available separately or together, okay? And that's been communicated. Uh, this is a list of the companies that have uh, uh, cited uh, our um, deliverable uh, deliverables in particular on uh, this list is for multiple mool, CGG, PGS, Schlumberger, list of oil companies that have uh, uh, published papers or made presentations that refer to this group's delivery as uh, uh, important for what they are uh, showing, yes? I don't have, to, you can read that slide well enough. Okay, so I'm gonna give a tutorial now. This uh, tutorial is gonna be it's gonna provide a math physics description of the relationship between a wave field, what creates it, what influences it, okay? There's gonna be two descriptions, one which describes a wave field everywhere and one that describes a wave field in a volume, uh, a description for a wave field in a volume. Uh, uh, the wave fields don't really care about what you're interested in. They have their own interests. They care about everything that uh, uh, brought them into being and everything that influences them. Our interests and the wave field's interests are not always aligned. You know, sometimes we are only interested in what is the wave field in this region. The wave field in that region cares about everything in the world that affects it, yes? Whether or not you're interested in it. So uh, watch how that happens. The benefit of this tutorial is the following. There are many methods that you're gonna see here. Um, wave field separation methods for the reference wave and the scattered wave. Deghosting methods, another type of wave separation. Wave prediction, a basis of what we call Clairbaugh three imaging, where you're predicting the source and receiver in a volume. Uh, inverse scattering series for free surface multiple, internal multiple, Q without Q, nonlinear AVO, depth imaging without the velocity. All of the methods I just mentioned can come from one single starting point and just derive. So if you don't like one of those methods, you have to in some way reject the whole logic because they come from one place under different assumptions, yes? So I think uh, given that common framework ha uh, lets all the diverse um, um, methods within this group that are dealing with different uh, steps in the seismic processing chain be derived from one place. 
I think that gives you some mental picture to leave and then understand, yes? So let's start. These are the methods I just mentioned. All of these methods are going to be uh, derived from some single mass. And the mass is going to be very simple. We're going to start. That equation one, assume you have a homogeneous whole space, which is acoustic. A, a whole world, a universe is homogeneous and acoustic, yes? And, um, and in that uh, space, imagine there is a source at R prime, we're looking at equation one now. Is, does this have a pointer? Okay, uh, equation one, if you look at uh, that as a, uh, a localized source, a Dirac delta source at R prime, you're looking at the field, here's a p one point uh, that's generating a uh, wave, that's, uh, there's a source at R prime, it is an energy source, and it generates a wave and you're observing it at R. And, uh, and in addition, you're looking at one frequency component of that wave, omega. It would start in T. So that's a starting point, and we know what that means. This equation two says, let's assume that instead of having this localized source, this Dirac delta at point R prime, we have a distributed source, rho of R prime and omega. Could be discrete points, it could be uh, continuous and discrete. Rho can be any function you like, yes? The amazing thing to me when I was a student and remains today, if you can find the causal solution to one, you immediately have the causal solution to two. That is mind-boggling. That if you know the solution to what happens when one point in the universe explodes, then you have the solution, the causal solution, where the source can be arbitrary. And it doesn't have to be just explode, you'll see in a minute. It's whatever that term is. Okay, so the solution to two, the causal solution to two can be written in terms of the causal solution to one is this. And this is a cornerstone of our, the methods here. It's just, uh, this gives you the field everywhere in terms of all the sources. That's an integral over all space, okay? And if you uh, want to derive it, just put del squared plus k squared on p. That'll act on g0, produce a Dirac delta. The Dirac delta times rho will give you rho. Solves the equation. And if uh, g0 plus is the causal, p will be causal, okay? That's a, uh, an essential um, equation for uh, understanding the methods in this group. So the, the source rho can be very general, and you'll see, including the energy source and the source of different wave classifications and wave types. We'll make that clear. Let's start for a minute and just look at the heterogeneous equation. Yes, the last was a, a homogeneous world and some, first a point source and then a distributed source. Now we have heterogeneous. Is there a pointer here? Like a, a light that shines? This is button here. This right button. Ah, cool. Yes. Okay, thank you. This C of R says the velocity in this, uh, for, this for this field P varies with position. It's heterogeneous. Uh, and we're assuming the uh, source is still RS, but it has some, let's say, source signature. Yes, some time dependence. But it's local in space, but not necessarily in time, yes? Then if you characterize the velocity, that uh, heterogeneous velocity, as one over c squared times one minus alpha, and then call k um, omega over c zero, then this equation four can be written in this form, where now this, um, looks like del squared plus k squared p is rho. This is rho. Now, with that uh, in mind, you can then write, using the, uh, the form several slides back, this form, if you put that rho, those two terms, in this equation three, one is a of omega delta, one is k squared alpha p, you get this equation. This is a relationship between P, it's not a solution. P is here and P is here, yes? It's a relationship between the total wave field 
and alpha. So what is the value of this? What is this? This is the wave that would result if you had a homogeneous medium where the source is at RS and it had a signature A of omega. This is the portion of the field that would exist if the medium was homogeneous. This is the additional part that makes the actual wave field because the medium is not homogeneous. Alpha here characterizes the difference between the actual velocity and C0, yes? So this source here is, a, is attributable to the difference, to the difference between the actual velocity from the definition of alpha. Oop. Here's alpha's definition. Alpha is clearly a measure of the difference between actual and reference. If alpha exists at a point, it means there's a difference between the actual velocity at that point and the reference velocity, okay? So how do you interpret this? You interpret it as follows. This we know what, how to interpret it. There's some kind of source signature explodes at RS and propagates as though it was a homogeneous world. This has its own interpretation. This says there's a source at RS, propagates to R prime, some point in the medium, to, to a point at which the alpha is non-zero. In other words, where there is a difference between reference and actual velocity. At that point, this factor is then the amplitude. Rs to R prime is an amplitude of the, this wave that goes from the source, the actual wave, to R prime. It picks up a factor alpha, which is a, a measure of the difference between actual and reference velocity, and then propagates as though it was a source, yes? from that heterogeneity out, yes, with G0 plus. The, these two sources, this is the, due to the source of the, um, the uh, air guns, the active source, this is what's called a passive source. Why? This term here, in other words, this is a G0 plus rho. This rho needs a wave to impinge on it at that point. And that point has to have some perturbation, some difference between actual and reference properties, yes? To be a source. That's called passive source. From the point of view of the methods in this group, whether the source rho, the pieces of rho are uh, active or passive will play no role in wave separation or wave prediction methods. If, if it doesn't care what rho is, it doesn't care what type of rho is, yes? When you hear students here saying that this is the rho due to the earth, rho due to the earth, what they're talking about is this is a, a rho, in other words, if you assume the homogeneous medium, then the earth has a deviation from that. And that uh, deviation represents a source, k squared alpha times the field at that point. And so they talk about the earth there's a row due to the earth. Or if you assume water everywhere, the air has a row because the difference between air and water will be an alpha, yes? Okay, so the key point is no matter what the origin of those sources are, whether it's active or whether it requires a field to be incident to generate that, uh, uh, the response due to that uh, uh, passive source, it's immaterial. The wave separation methods, if they say there are sources on this side, there is, it doesn't matter what the type of source is. That's important, yes? So uh, you'll see that. No, there's terms on, on the right-hand side of an equation, yes? Terms. Okay, so here's the elastic generalization. In other words, here's a P equation, and now you have three sources. You have this guy, which is for some uh, P source, uh, the, the wave shape. Uh, it's uh, located at RS. And then you have two, two factors here that will be sources. One is for P incident, and then that P incident to a point is looking for changes in lambda, mu, and rho. 
lambda mu and rho will then generate a p, yes, a scattered wave from that. Um, and here you have a shear wave incident, yes, at some point, and that VPS is looking for changes in mu and rho, yes, only. And so if there are changes in mu and rho there, when that incident p arrives, it generates a p wave. In other words, yes? Because it's G0 plus going to P, you understand? So P can come from what the air guns do, what a P when it hits heterogeneity produces, what an S hits heterogeneities can produce P. Yes, all different sources of elastic P. So you can write uh, an elastic as well. Whoop. Okay. This, so that um, form, this form, which you see, that P causal is an integral of all the sources, whatever the origin is, with G0 plus is a cornerstone to what we're going to be doing here. It gives you the field everywhere, but it needs all the sources everywhere. This, we, we need one more relationship. Well, the, other, the, the other relationship is, give me the field only inside a volume, okay? The, the, uh, this uh, whole business here comes from linearity and superposition, that's all, yes? That del squared plus k squared is linear, and it's superimposing weighted sums on the delta, yes? Is gonna be a weighted sum on the G0, yes? That's it. <coughs> There's a, a different uh, form that has a totally different origin, thanks to Isaac Newton, who said that you, uh, the fundamental theorem of the integral calculus says you can integrate a function uh, over an interval and replace that by another function only at the endpoints. That's absolutely amazing. You have some function, yes, you sum up all the values and that's replaceable. And the antiderivative turns out to do that. And of course, that then led Gauss to do the same. An integral of a volume is replaceable by um, a, a anti, you see you have a derivative here, yes? So you have a, and then uh, you go from the divergence theorem or Gauss's theorem to Green's theorem on the bottom line. So that, these are uh, essentially identities within the assumptions necessary for um, these um, theorems. In other words, it's, it's any two functions, psi and phi, on that bottom. In other words, uh, and then what we're going to do is take that second, um, it's called green second identity, and put in for those two functions, one is our actual field P, the other is G0. The, uh, the green uh, our solution to G0's equation. This is very important. That equation one, what we're assuming is that G0 satisfies that equation, period, okay? And that P satisfies its equation, which is two. So in that uh, P del squared G0, G0 del squared P, put in for del squared G0 and del squared P what the differential equations say they are. Minus K squared G0 plus delta, and then for P, minus K squared P plus rho. Put that in, in that green second identity. In other words, in for del squared G0 and del squared P on the uh, left-hand side, substitute the differential equations they satisfy. All you have assumed there, that's very important for what we're about to do. When you, have, when you make that substitution, you have not assumed anything about G0 being causal, yes? All you assumed is that del squared G0 satisfies minus K squared G0 plus delta. G0 can be any solution to that equation, causal, anti-causal, causal plus anti-causal over two, any of an infinite number of solutions, as long as del square G0 plus K square G0 equals delta in the volume, yes, in the volume, meaning for R and R prime in the volume. Uh, when you substitute those differential equations for uh, 
del squared G0 and del squared P, you end up with this form on the bottom, which says that um, for P in the volume, in other words, we're after a solution, for, not for P for all space necessarily, but provide a relationship that gives us P in some uh, region only, yes? So uh, that um, is, it says that to find the field in the volume, you need an integral of the sources that are in the volume and a surface integral, yes? This will give you this is an amazing statement, okay? Not at all reasonable or intuitive. Any G0, any G0 of an infinite number that you substitute on the right-hand side here, any solution to del square G0 plus K squared G0 is delta, as long as that's uh, what G0 satisfies in the volume, R and R prime in the volume, then any will give you P and P will be causal, as long as this surface integral exists. That's extremely important to underst understand migration theory, which is gonna come up tomorrow, yes? Classic migration theory. In other words, why? Why a, a minute ago, when we had this business, if I want P to be causal, G plus, G0 plus had to be causal. You put G0 uh, on the right-hand side anti-causal, and you will not produce P causal. Okay, you're, you're doing superpositions of causal, and then you get causal. How in the world can you have any G0 on that uh, last line and produce causal? The reason is the following. You have P and grad P dot N here. And those are assumed to come from measurements, which are causal. If you put causal information in there, you are not just doing superposition. You have a boundary value problem. You've nailed down, yes? And that's what allows any G0 to give you P causal. If that surface integral is not there, then that's not the case anymore. That surface integral needs to be there. Do you understand? Okay, so that's a very important, um, there are many, many choices of what that G0 can be. And many of the applications in this group, the difference between wave separation and wave prediction, is what choice of G0. So, in this formula, if you have two, two solutions, one for all space, six, and one for just a part of space, eight, Six, you must have G0 plus. Eight, you do not have to have G0 plus, yes? Any G0, yes? For our wave separation methods, in other words, we're going to, um, th these two equations will derive wave field separation, deghosting, for example, wave prediction with subsurf uh, information, Clairbaut 3 imaging, and all ISS. All inverse scattering methods are going to come from those two, okay? So that's very interesting all by itself, yes? So if you're having issues with how can you do depth without the velocity, where's the logic to that, you've got to start with this. You've got to have a problem here because once you're on that logic train, you know, it's going to drive you to that, those uh, conclusions. So you've you got to go very upstream in your thinking if you want to say that makes no sense, <laughs> okay? which you're free to, okay? All the ISS uh, internal multiple work was considered insane by mathematicians and physicists in industry. Now people use it. I don't think they know where it comes from. If they did, they would understand that there are other things possible. They still say the other things are impossible, okay? Well, I tell our students that's good. If they understood, they'd get there before you. Just make it happen, apply it on field data, show the difference, and then they'll say, of course, wave equation migration was considered radical of any variety. Uh, when I first worked in oil, the research lab where I was in, they didn't want to hear about a finite difference, they didn't want to hear about schneider kirchhoff they didn't want to hear about FK. The, the word was, the wave equation is no panacea. You, you understand? So it's no... Uh, it's no surprise that new th thinking will have a certain uh, reception, okay? If you want to be better re received and you're a researcher, don't do new thinking. You know, do some variety of RTM or FWI or, uh, you know, 
you know, some, some variety of what they're doing that will keep them comfortable. And if they're comfortable, they'll support you. If it takes a big investment of their time to understand what you're doing, the chances of getting support is smaller. They just don't know what you're talking about, okay? And they're busy. So we're very fortunate for the amount of support we have had and do have. Understood, yes? Okay, so let's talk about wave separation because that's the first set of talks you're gonna see this morning. Wave separation, in, uh, in, in particular, deghosting. The, separate the reference wave from the scattered wave, predicting the source signature radiation pattern, and source and receiver deghosting. So it starts with this equation. And uh, we said you can pick any G0. For wave separation methods, pick G0. We said eight, you can pick any G0. For the particular application of wave separation methods, pick that G0 in the eight to agree with six, okay? For that application. For other applications, we will not do that, okay? It won't work if you do it for migration theory, for example. So if in this equation, as you see here, we choose uh, G0 to be G0 plus, then the um, equation which integrated over all volume can be written as an integral of the volume plus an integral of the universe outside the volume. In other words, Equation six, which integrates over the whole universe, can be broken up into integrating over a volume plus an integral over the universe outside the volume, yes? Why are we doing that? Because we want to compare it to eight, yes? The first term in eight, if I choose G0 to be G0 plus, will be a piece of six that's integrated only over the volume. So what's the big deal? Then the part that's an integral outside the volume, the universe minus the volume, must be the surface integral. Yes, for P evaluated inside the volume. In other words, the uh, integral over all space can be broken up into an integral on the volume plus the all space outside the volume. So you get from that, uh, for points R inside the volume, the surface integral, gives you the contribution due to sources outside the volume to the field in the volume. Let's uh, review that logic for a second. Then we'll get right to deghosting. In other words, th this equation only gives you the field in the volume, yes? The other equation, integrate over all, uh, all the universe, gives you the field everywhere. But in the volume, they must agree. The field is the field. If I evaluate it at a point in the volume from a formula that's only val valid in the volume, and if I ev evaluate that field at that point from a formula that's valid everywhere, they have to agree the, f the field is a physical quantity. It's not some math a mathematical artifact that cares about my math surface, yes? So that uh, says that th this first term on the right-hand side plus this surface integral gives you the field in the volume. This, which comes from uh, the field in all space, this is an integral over the sources in the volume, this is an integral of the sources outside the volume, this plus this must be this plus this for R in the volume. Hence, the surface integral is the contribution due to sources outside the volume to the field inside the volume. Okay, this is not a new theory. You can look at Morse and Feshbach chapter six. You can look at Born and Wolf page 100, yes? Uh, they call it the extinction theorem in different places. We're just applying it seismically, okay? So what it says is the field at a point in space cares about all the sources. It couldn't care less what your interest is in this volume. It cares about everything that affected it. If your interest is only in the volume, the math says, look, we'll run a compromise. You don't have to give me all the sources. 
but you have to give me the sources where you're interested in the field. In addition, you have to give me a surface integral, which will give the effect of sources outside on the field inside. Okay? What's amazing to me is I don't need to know what the sources are outside. All I need to know is the field and the normal derivative on the boundary. And I have no need to know, and those sources outside can be air guns, it could be heterogeneities, those alphas, yes. It could be of any uh, nature. All I need to know is the field and the normal derivative on a closed surface, and I will get the contribution to sources outside to the field inside without having any idea what those sources are, no matter what the origin of the sources are. Okay, it could be a VPP, VPS, analastic, and so on. Okay, so uh, th there's um, two applications here. One is this historic, the first one. Let me get right to the let me get right to the deghosting one, yes, for, for time, since that's what the, uh, um, the first group of people will be talking about. In other words, what this is saying is, you can pick different reference media. The commitment in this business reference and sources is, reference plus sources better give you reality, yes, give you the real world. If your reference is simpler, homogeneous, then you gotta have, uh, sources for the air gun, sources for making every heterogeneity. If you include some heterogeneity, like air and then water in your reference, yes, in your reference, then the sources only have to be what you left out. Deviation from reference, yes? So, let's just race to the, this is the original work with Seacrest 1990. Let's get to the, this is the ghost thing. The deghosting work here, um, a major pioneer, Jingfang Zhang, who's at BP, and uh, for the source side deghosting using Green's theorem, and uh, Dr. Jim Mayen for applications to field data, as I mentioned, at both PGS and ExxonMobil. And those, uh, the PGS results are published, and ExxonMobil results and PGS are in his thesis, okay? And Dr. Mayen's sitting in the back here. So the idea there is there's a homogeneous whole space, yes? So you start off with the whole world is homogeneous and the whole world is homogeneous and water, yes? That's what we're gonna assume. So everything that deviates from that has to be a source. So there's a source air, which in other words, the alpha of air, yes? There's a air gun in the water and there's an earth because the Earth is not water, so it's gonna have some alpha, beta, whatever, gamma, the changes, yes, with those passive source concept. Three sources. And this uh, whole space has this causal Green's function, just an exploding 3D E to the I care of raw. Yes, just goes from every source, and just leaves. That's um, important. We chose here, in developing this uh, deghosting, uh, a reference medium such that the, um, for the whole space uh, homogeneous reference medium, if you have a, a, a source here, the wave that leaves always goes away. If I made it homogeneous plus a free surface, it would do this and could go like that, you understand? I don't want that. So that was on, on purpose why I chose homogeneous whole space. So every source here is, whether it's air, uh, uh, air gun or earth is with that homogeneous reference and that homogeneous Green's function, that row G0 plus, that whatever that row is, it sends a wave away, out, yes, oh, out. That's crucial. So we take this integral, okay, we take this integral and we evaluate this integral uh, like this this uh, um, surface uh, integral, and we close it uh, on top. In other words, the, the base of that uh, surface is the measurement surface, your cable, and then it closes at an uh, um, infinite um, hemisphere, and because that's G0 plus and P are causal on the hemisphere, that goes away, Sommerfeld, okay? So your, this, the closed surface is the surface on your measurement surface. And then the source 
outside that volume, in other words, you have a cable, you have a, a volume, you have two sources inside, air and air guns. You have one source outside the earth, yes? There's only one source outside the volume, rho earth. And rho earth is sending a wave up because of G zero plus, yes? Each of those rows are sending out, yes? Because of that choice. So if, if you pick a point to output that, um, th this uh, right-hand side, which is above the cable, so it's in the volume, but below the air gun. In other words, the air gun is gonna be going down if I pick a point like that. The, the air is gonna, its wave is down, yes? And the, the portion of the total field the, and the contribution that the source outside the volume, which is only rho earth, produces at that point in the volume is up because the earth explodes, G0 plus, yes? It's an up wave. If the output point is below the source, then it is the only up wave because the, the portion due to the air guns is down. If, I'm, if my output point of that integral in that volume, in other words, let me slow down. This integral gives you the contribution due to sources outside the volume, yes? If the volume is this, outside is just Earth. And that source is, has a wave moving up, always up, away from the Earth, because it's rho G0 plus, yes? Homogeneous uh, outgoing wave. So it's in that volume, the, the contribution to the total field due to the Earth is always up. It's going away, yes? We want to evaluate it at a point where it's the only up, yes? Why? Because up is receiver deghosted. If I have a total field here, it's a piece is going down and a piece is going up. Receiver deghosted gets the up part, yes? So I, uh, at any point in the upper half space, the contribution due to the uh, Earth is up, but we want it to be evaluated at a point where that's the only, in other words, here you have this volume, this is the cable, here's the rho Earth, here's rho air, here's rho air guns, this is where air, yes? The, the rho earth, with rho earth, with G zero plus, this is just a, a whole a space causal goes out. This, the contribution that rho earth produces to the total field inside this volume is always up. Okay, it's always up, it's just going away. In order to, ha to have a deghosting algorithm, I want the contribution that rho earth produces in here to be evaluated at a point where at that point, what the earth produces is the only up wave, yes? Then that surface integral will be a deghoster. This rho, the air gun does this. The air does that. So the air is always down. Uh, uh, below the air water boundary. But the air gun, if I evaluate this point here, this guy would be, have a contribution going up too. And that surface integral would not be the deghoster. Yes, it would still be an up wave due to the earth. So when you evaluate that integral on the right hand side at a point R below the air guns, at below the air guns, this guy is a down wave. This guy, the air is a down wave. The air guns are down. The rho earth is up, and the only up. And if that surface integral is the contribution due to rho earth, yes, then, which it is, then you have re, uh, uh, achieved receiver deghosting. In other words, you separate the wave into up and down. Okay. So uh, another application, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Jingfang Zhang uh, uh, extended this to source deghosting. You do another uh, um, integral. You uh, okay? You repeat that, and I suggest you uh, 
look at his thesis or Dr. Main's thesis and, uh, to, and papers published by both. So this just says the receiver degaussian formula. Now this formula, this formula here, if your, uh, if your measurement surface is horizontal, yes? If your measurement is horizontal and you Fourier transform uh, over that measurement surface, this formula for deghosting will give you PVZ, okay? Will give you PVZ. The, the benefit of this formula is it doesn't assume it's horizontal, it's a measurement surface. Yes, it gives you the ghost thing no matter what that surface is uh, for a point above the cable. And here's uh, uh, um, an issue. If you apply that de ghosting algorithm, uh, which is uh, to be evaluated above the cable and below the source, if you try to make that output closer and closer to the cable, what happens is those Green's functions, as you get closer, get narrower, yes? And at some point, you don't have a sampling to catch them. So it precludes actually directly, um, directly uh, deghosting your actual data in X omega, yes? So, uh, what ha how, so how does PVZ work? Well, when you do a Fourier transform, you assume the sampling's adequate. And if it's not, PVZ will suffer, okay? So that issue, you understand? PVZ is assuming adequate, whatever that means, yes? So, uh, so the, 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 the benefit that you're about to see from my colleagues uh, Jing Wu and uh, Zhen Zhang and Yu Chang Shen are how to apply this deghosting formula, yes? For example, first of all, Jing Wu showed how to deghost your actual data when the acquisition is not horizontal. When you don't want to deghost some other data, you want to deghost your data, yes? This says you can't directly deghost it, yes? It has to be above. So, what Jing Wu does very cleverly is she says it's deghosted above, but it's a one way wave. So I'll use a shift, a stole shift, to go back to the cable. Yes? And she does that. And that is how the actual deghosting will, uh, can occur on a non-horizontal acquisition, yes? Without violating, the, uh, the, so this issue is never, okay? It's not outputting the deghosting there. It outputs it above and then uses a different algorithm to go down to the cable, yes? Okay, so, Oh, this is talking about other applications. Let's wait for this. What this is saying is, um, when you have this row, which is A of omega delta and K squared alpha P, let's say your source, let's say you're doing migration, and your source was outside the volume. You know, you're trying to migrate below the cable and the source is up here, yes? So the RS is outside the volume, yes? And let's assume, as we do in conventional migration, that you know the velocity in the volume. You don't assume, migration does not assume, as people who try to disparage Clairbaut said when I was younger, oh, oh, that's wonderful, John. Uh, if you know the velocity everywhere, you can migrate. Well, if I know the velocity, John, everywhere, I don't need you, you know? That's, they don't understand migration, those people. Migration does not need the velocity everywhere. It needs the velocity to be able to determine this above the unknown reflector, yes? But I remember that kind of disparaging, uh, uh, know nothing comment, you know? So, um, but in the volume that you're trying to predict the wave field, you need to know the medium in migration. What does that say here? That means alpha, you assume that your reference velocity and the actual agree in the volume, yes? So the volume term will be zero because the source is outside and if we assume that we know the velocity, the actual velocity in the volume, then alpha is zero and you, you end up with just a surface integral, yes? The volume integral is zero. 
then you have to figure out how you're going to predict P, okay, P inside the volume from only measurements on top. Yes, that's the key. That's where all these G0s start coming in. Well, that's what we'll discuss tomorrow. Yes? So let's take a step back. Let's say you don't know. Let's say you don't know the medium. Yes? Like inverse scattering. We don't know the, the velocity and the volume. Then, then what? This equation? Just assume you don't know rho. Rho k squared alpha p. You start that, you got, the, you got the forward series, the inverse series, everything right from there, okay? So if you assume you know the medium, then rho is zero. If you assume that rho, you don't know the medium, you got k squared alpha p. You got a, a, a relationship, yes, that you got to deal with. They all come from the same story, is the point. Different assumptions. Okay, that's a, a long um, introduction. The, the bottom line here is there's a surface integral, right? Yes? with a simple Green's function, a homogeneous whole space Green's function that can do deghosting. And uh, the, the three talks that follow right now will be showing you uh, contributions, how to deal with non-horizontal acquisition, yes? And the impact, what happens if you ignore, what happens if the acquisition is not horizontal and you assume it is, how does that affect deghosting, free surface multiple, internal multiple, depth imaging? You'll see all that breakdown, yes? And then what happens if you accommodate it to all those different steps, okay? So why don't we take a break, yes? And then we'll start the next talks. Thanks.